Now, LifeAdministration.com presents the Life Administration Podcast. Here are your hosts, Leslie Loftus and Ryan Taylor. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Life Administration Podcast. We got a big one for you today, episode 31. With me, as always, is... Leslie Loftus. Hello, everybody. Hey, guys. Uh, wow. What a crazy couple days. Yeah. My goodness. Um, the the re, re-emergence of right. corona has come back. So, um, yeah, here in Harris County, um, Texas, we are all... We're not officially locked down, but we're kind of looking back at, well, we might be soon. Yep. Certainly, everybody's back to hunkering down. So there, there is sort of the mentality again of if you don't have to go anywhere, don't don't go anywhere, right? And I also let all the businesses now masks are no mm-hmm. longer optional. Right. You have to go in there. You have to wear them. So mm-hmm. uh, I guess it's just a plea for us to say, continue to stay safe. Wash those hands, wear your mask, all the good do stuff. all the right things, and just... Uh, One happy thing is there are more masks available. I mean, now you can go and get... You can get you masks know, anywhere. Yeah, you can get masks anywhere. There's... My... Uh, supply definitely went up. My my mother-in-law, actually, she made us all, like, custom masks. Uh-huh. And I got Captain America mask, and it looks so cool. Awesome. That I basically never want to take it off anyway. I'm just like, yeah, look at my mask. It's so neat. I like it. Yep. I so, like it. Okay. We're, we're going to cut the banter, though. Okay, because we've got, we've got a big, fat, kind of heavy episode um, for you here today. And I, so I, for one, am, I'm really looking forward to this because mortgages have been one of those things that have um, intimidated me quite mm-hmm. a bit in, in the past. And some circumstances, I think, are evolving in my personal life. I shared with you right before we right. kind of went on the air that... Uh, we're going to have to, we've been renting for a long time. My job sort of dictated before I was a music teacher that renting was the best thing because I was only living in one place for basically 18 months or so. So it didn't make sense to buy. We've been here for five years going on six years now. Um, This is the place that we're going to be. And we have family and, you know, think people that are getting older and, you know, as you sort of, you're starting to read the tea leaves a little bit. Uh, we're going to have to make some pretty, some pretty big changes. And I would just have to imagine that a lot of people that are in my shoes that are first time home buyers, or you just look at the information that's out there and it's scary. Buying a home, getting a mortgage, all, there are lots and lots of details in there that can make an already intimidating process look more intimidating because especially if it's your first time, you don't know you don't even know how to judge them. You don't even know if you're doing it right. And heck, you don't know when, you know, you can Google for some checklist of how to do them, but you have no idea if you're getting, because there's all sorts of mortgage companies and real estate companies that'll come up with these checklists, but then they're, they're full of affiliate links. How do you even judge if you've got a good checklist or not? You know, and until you, and this is the kind of stuff, some of this stuff is really big and you don't want to learn it the hard way because a home is the largest purchase most people ever make. Right. Um, so that's why this is going to be a long episode. Right. So we've got I'm, lots of details to lot, cover. So lots we're of details. Kinda, um, and also we figure lots of other people are going through this as well because with um, COVID roaming around, tons of people are like, I'm getting out of the city and I'm going to move or they're going to be, you know, I want to have some place that I can retreat so that when the city goes crazy, my husband and I are actually getting a mortgage right now for, because we're kind of preparing for, okay, I'm not so sure, certain that school is going to start back up. In which case, if I'm going to homeschool, I want to be able to homeschool where we have some more outdoor options. Yes. Right. Um, we're not alone in this. Apparently right now, um, Oh, I might be wrong on this, but my mortgage company told me they did more mortgages in March than they did in the prior proceeding of 2019 between people wanting to move out, people wanting to get something more solid, and interest rates dropping, so people doing refinancing of their current mortgages. They're crazy busy right now. So we're going to talk mortgages, buying a house and all that. Things. Yeah. You, you don't even have to be a, a realtor or be in the, the field to know that interest rates are criminally low yes. right now. And yes. so if you're in the position to buy a house and it makes sense for you, 
this is a time that you would probably want to expedite the process a yes. little bit. Mm -hmm. So we're we're gonna we're gonna go in. Uh, the table has been set. Episode okay. thirty one mortgages. Hit the hit the green light. We're rocking and rolling. Number one, the process. All right. Take it away, Leslie. So first of all, you've decided you're going to buy a house. You're going to buy real estate. Okay. Most people, unless you grew up, say, in a realtor family or you have a law degree or you were a realtor yourself, um, you're going to want a realtor. Um, actually, my husband and I fit all of those categories, and we still like having a realtor just because there are so many little tiny bits of paperwork and everything else that have to go along. Now, lots of people would like to avoid a realtor because usually um, there's a 3% commission um, on sale. So for whatever the property sale sells for, um, the buyer's agent and the seller's agent take 3% of commission. Um, and so people think, oh my gosh, it'll be cheaper. I won't have to pay that 3%. I can negotiate around that 3% if I don't have an agent. True, you can. And if you know what you're doing, well, then if you know what you're doing, you're not listening to this podcast. Right. Mm -hmm. um, everybody who's listening to this podcast for information, get a realtor. Best ways to get a realtor, re ask around. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you happen to know somebody who you trust who is a realtor, um, if, some, if a couple of your friends have just gone through this process, word of mouth is probably your best way to figure it out. Also think about where you want to be, where you want the house to be. And it's usually advantageous to get somebody that is a specialist in that area. Yes. Right. So realtors tend to have regions um, that, you know, well, I specialize in this neighborhood or I specialize in beach houses in this city. Try to get somebody who, in, unless it's somebody that you've used in the past or comes highly recommended and is particularly trustworthy to you, there might be circumstances that you bring a realtor in from the outside, but for the most part, get one that's highly recommended and local to the area you are buying in. Yeah, trust is, this is one of those things that trust has to be paramount because yes. when you think about how many purchases are you making that are going to last 20, 30 years potentially, um, and there are so many ins and outs when it comes to property. Maybe, maybe there are roads being built that yep. you're not aware of, construction that you're not aware of. Um, there might be properties that are about to go on the market that aren't on the market yet, so you can't see, and the realtor that is knowledgeable in that area has already been contacted about it and can give you a heads up. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of, yeah, all sorts of things come with somebody who specializes in the area. Yeah. So the, the good news is, you know, 20 years ago, you had to get in the car, right? Yep. And drive and drive around, but we don't right. have to do that anymore. Nope. Now you can do preliminary checks online. So mm -hmm. most major cities, most areas, um, you will find various websites that will, um, major cities will have websites dedicated to like, so their realtors here in Houston, we have Houston Realtors Association yep. and it's a comprehensive listing of everything for rent, for sale. For, you know, every once in a while, there's somebody that's doing broker only. Mm -hmm. um, you can also find um, for sale by owner. Um, you can find websites exist for pretty much every property you would like. And you can also go and do maps and you can say, I just want to be in this zip code. Or you can literally draw a map with a sketch tool and say, I just want to be in this area. You can search by school district. You can search by number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. This is great for getting an overview of what's available in the area that you want to live in and what its prices are like. Mm -hmm. But caveat here, and I'm sorry, I was hard on that B for you. So mm -hmm. Ryan told me right before this that I need to be careful with my B's, P's, and T's because <laughs> some of these mics are really good. And Okay. So the thing you need to watch out for is talent mm -hmm. or lack thereof amongst real estate photographers. There are houses that can look so much bigger in the pictures. There are houses that can look dingy and dirty based upon poor photography. Okay, definitely the internet is huge for helping you weed things out, for helping you get your own idea of what the comparable market is. One mm -hmm. of the things real estate agents used to do a lot of is they would have to provide um, comps to their clients, which is comparable properties. So here's a property with the same kind of square footage and the same kind of um, lot size, et cetera. And so I'd give you the comparable um, 
estimates mm-hmm. of what things were um, went on the market for, what they actually sold for. Okay, now online, you can kind of do your own comp research yep. a little bit yourself, um, and it's really nice, but don't rely on just that. If a property by its description really seems to hit you and the pictures just don't wow you, go look anyway. If a property, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I want. This is perfect. This is beautiful. These pictures, everything. Go look at the property. <laughs> okay. So lo- let, me, let me just say this. My best friend, Sean, who we talk about all, very much, who now uh-huh. has a big boy job and is no longer with us. We miss you, buddy. Uh-huh. But he, uh, his job before this is that he would do real estate photography. Uh-huh. Oh, by the way, Sean is ultra talented. He really is. He did for his portfolio. He took a few pictures of this yes. house. They were, they were amazing. Awesome. <laughs> and, and so like this man will take, this is why I just want people to understand like, what are they actually seeing when they click on the pictures? This man would, would take a picture. He'd make sure the room was the biggest. This man would superimpose sunsets mm-hmm. in, in, in the background. Right. I mean, make sure everything was lit perfectly. There was like a fly yeah. coming around here. Yeah. Um, shoe fly. Shoe fly. So he would make everything look amazing. Mm-hmm. I, and, and so you just, you can't just go by pictures and, and we're visual people. We love mm-hmm. when we see it, we go, Ooh, this one feels right, honey. Let's uh-huh. go check it out. Uh, and, and, and like you said, you got to get your own eyes right. on it. You have to have, and, and the, the exact opposite happened for, for our house, the house that we're renting right now. Uh, when we, when we looked at it online, the pictures were Eh. As a matter of fact, we literally just looked at them last night because we were talking about right. this topic. <laughs> and we looked we're like, oh, this is rough. And you know, the house, uh-huh. all the walls were white, you know, it was just tchotchkes everywhere. In any case, uh, not not to go on too long, but you, you, you gotta you gotta do the Lay leg your work. Own, yeah. Gotta yeah. do the legwork. Help use the website to get background information, to come up with the list of things that you want to also to give your realtor some more idea of well. We're really looking for this, you know, we'd like a bigger lot or, you know what, it really matters to us that the bedrooms are, the bathrooms are in suite or inside Mm -hmm. um, each of the bedrooms, you know, whatever it is that, you know, I'm sorry, I hate Italian architecture or what, okay, well then just knock those off because you're never going to feel home with it. So it's great for base information, not so much for making the actual decision. Yeah, absolutely. So here, so you found the home and I think this is where for me, I get intimidated right. is because that uh, other stuff is kind of, that's the fun really, part. It, it's sort of fun. I mean, yeah, as like, far as home, home buying goes, it's, right. full, it's full of potential. It's mm-hmm. you've got your imagination. You going. put your dreams into this. Look yes. at this house on the corner you can lot. Picture yeah. yourself baking apple pies oh, yeah. in the kitchen. Oh, yeah. No, no, beautiful. No, 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 no. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. And then it comes to, yeah, let, let's get to the harsh reality of we got to get the money together for, right. for this house. So talk us a little bit through that. Okay. Just like with your real estate agent, you want to find a builder or builder, excuse me, a lender based upon recommendations. Usually, um, if you trust your real estate agent and you have a good relationship, they probably have some good options for you. Um, also ask around to some of your friends. Um, and then, okay. So the lender is, most people don't have enough cash on hand. Let's just, cause it's easy math. You're buying a house. You're buying a house for a hundred thousand dollars. Thank goodness you said a hundred thousand. I was like, she's gonna say something like two hundred and fifty, and I'm not gonna be able to follow along. Okay, (laughs) no, we're we're gonna keep the math real safe. Thank goodness. So a hundred thousand dollar house. You've done. You've taken out the mortgage calculators that you can find online, Mm -hmm. or you know something else, and you've figured out that with your income you can afford a hundred thousand dollar house. Yes. Thirty second commercial break. Go for it. Don't be house poor. Concur completely. Right. That was some of. That was my mother-in-law's advice to us as yep. well. So if you don't know what house poor is, one of the things that my, my stepfather actually taught me when I was going out on my own, he said, listen, you don't think the math can work, but it can work. Your, one week of your paycheck should be able to cover your rent slash mortgage or whatever. Mm-hmm. It, it might seem a little bit low, but better to do that than to get in a situation when you have this wonderful house, but you can't afford anything in it, or then you have insurance go up, property taxes, yeah. the whole thing. So, you know, I error on the side of 
a cheaper house right. than a, than like, oh, I think we can afford this if yes. we just nah. being house poor is when you take that mortgage math or you take that house buying math and you max it out, saying, okay, we make this much money. And this is the maximum that the math tells us we can get. And you maybe even stretch a little bit. Mm-hmm. So what ends up happening is that you have all of your assets in, you have all of your cash in a non-liquid asset. So yeah, you've got the great lovely house, but if something happens or if expenses go up, you have to sell the house in order to get the cash flow, yep. right? So you can't, you're locked, you're locked in, you're not, you're not fluid, you're house poor. Yep. So you've got the asset, you don't have the money. So I... I guess I'm confused. So when you get that math, you go and you you don't max out those formulas. Yeah. So I I'm gonna have a lot of questions here okay. because as like I said, as like within, I was thinking of we're gonna be buying a house in the next eighteen months. Mm-hmm. Now all of a sudden I'm thinking I have to be looking at buying a house within the next three to six months because right. like I said, I'm reading the tea leaves here. And by the way, that's a tight timeline because as we're getting ready to get yep. to getting the mortgage and stuff like that. Three months, you kind of need to get started on looking now if you want. Right. Yeah. Hence why we were looking at photos last, <laughs> last night. night. So, mm-hmm. um, and I, it's not, again, it's not a super hard timeline, but I'm asking questions because I have lots of questions. And so I guess in my mind, and I, I think that most people would think, seek a lender, wait, but I have a bank. I have Wells Fargo. Can I just go to Wells Fargo and get a... Get yes, a... you can. And a matter of fact, if you have a good relationship with your bank, do go to your bank and check because here's the other thing about getting a lender. You're going to want to look around a little bit and see because the, your current bank might give you a better interest rate because you are a current customer. But your current bank also might be a smaller bank or maybe they're not do maybe you're a bigger client and they're not doing jumbo loans, right? What and jumbo is when you have a mortgage that the mortgage comes out to more than a million. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's all sorts of, you might want to get a couple of, a couple of banks or a couple of lenders telling you, this is the product. They'll call it a product. This is the product we offer. Um, And we'll get into the names for all of the products in just a little bit when we talk about mortgages. Um, But yes, one of the first places you're going to look at is your own bank where Mm -hmm. you um, have your, um, where you have your own accounts and hopefully you have a good relationship with them. Yeah. Obviously, if you don't have a good relationship with your bank or you don't really like your bank, or you've been thinking of moving banks, well, don't call them for the mortgage because right. you're just going to be tied in once more. You know? Right. Maybe look into go ahead. Okay, you know what? I'm going to move all of my bank account and stuff and I'm going to ask this new bank, hey, I'm thinking of moving my stuff to you and I also need a mortgage. They might be willing to make you a bit of a... People do this all the time with um, cell phone service. Absolutely. Right. You can kind of do shopping for a lender a little bit like shopping for a cell phone store. You have leverage. You might yes. not think that you, you don't have leverage, but you right. have leverage. If the leverage is, hey, I want to move my stuff over, right. bank A gave me whatever interest rate, what would you be willing to do? I mean, they want to earn your business. Right. Like This is how they make a good portion of their money. Um, so, so they're going to want to earn your business. Right. So, so, but you can't go in there thinking that you're at the mercy of the bank. It should be the other way that, that they should sort of be at your mercy a little bit that, you know, right. cause there's lots now, of banks. There's lo- yes. And there's lots of federal reg- regulations that they have to deal with. And here we go. This is where it gets really intimidating. Mm-hmm. Once you have chosen a lender and decided to apply the application process for a mortgage is Onerous. Okay. Let's just say, so here I am. I teach a course on life administration. I've done things like how to come up with a filing system and stuff. Mm -hmm. I know where my bank account statements are and stuff like this. When I was going, when I was applying for this mortgage that we're looking for, um, and so this was just last week, the banker actually complimented me because I managed to get all of the information that we needed to have in a matter of about three days. Wow. And it, is not, he's like, usually it takes people a couple of weeks to put together this information. When I tell you that these, when I go back to the, to the episode on filing and how to, you know, basic home management and how to come up with a filing system, Mm -hmm. this is where that two weeks turned into three days because they ask for so much, in so much obscure stuff and, um, you have to get credit rate. Oh, the application process is just a pain in the butt. Yes. It sure, mm-hmm. it sure is. Um, yeah, it's and long. it's mostly financial data. They want to yep. know your life insurance. They want to know 
um, your often your utility bills. They need to have access to your credit stuff. They need so they need your social security number and driver's license, and they need to know where all your bank accounts are, where all your investment accounts are. Um, if you have any other income, any other forms of income, if you are say um, a divorced person and you are either paying or receiving child support, it's almost as bad as putting together your taxes. Yeah, I mean, at the again, this is their business, and right. they, you know, they're trying to make a sound decision as well. Right. So they're going to want all the information. So right. you got to be prepared to 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 give it all. Right. Um, and then they are going to check it too. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. by the way, don't get the idea that you're just going to fudge any little, no, 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 no. Cause after you give them the application, typically 15 plus days right now, so many people are going for mortgages. It's running more like 30 days for a dedicated mortgage company to be able to check all your stuff and actually approve you for them. Mm -hmm. Um, 30 days just won't. Yeah. So they're going through, they're going through all of it. They're actually yeah. checking. So how important is getting your credit score right for when you go to, to, to get a, a house? Um, quite important. It's going to dictate a lot of which product the bank is willing to offer you. Mm -hmm. um, and usually that means how much interest they're going to charge you. Mm -hmm. um, so you will find something similar when you go to buy a car. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, they will quickly check your credit score at the auto dealership. And if you have a poor credit score, then they're going to charge you more interest to borrow money for the car. Same general thing goes for mortgages, except for the fact they're really going to check all the numbers and they're not just going off your credit score. So they're looking at other things as well. So if you happen to have um, a really good credit score because you've managed to kind of play a, a talented shell game with debt. Right. Okay. That'll come out in the mortgage search. Mm -hmm. Right. So that that won't work. Same thing if you also have a lower credit score because, you know, you haven't been playing the credit score game with your debt, but you, so you don't, for instance, one of the things that bugs people a lot about credit scores is that sometimes your credit score goes down because you don't have much debt. Right. Okay. And so they can't get a read on you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mortgages are not, mortgage searches will kind of ease that because they're like, oh, they like the fact that you don't have much debt. Now, the problem, you know, if you still have a lower credit score, that's still not great, but they're going to see, oh, well, she doesn't have a great credit score, mainly because she doesn't go into debt at all. So they don't know much about her credit period. Okay. I'm still willing to give her a better rate than right. the mortgage. Right. Um, but yeah, it's a much more in-depth process than say applying for. So I, I just did a little research before we started because I was like, I actually don't know that much, but when it comes to credit scores, Again, like in, in the article that I'm reading mirrors exactly what you just said. However, the difference between having a fair credit score and an excellent credit score on the average, mm -hmm. and this is for a $250,000 right. purchase. So on the average over the course of a 30-year loan is $86,000. So it's something to keep in mind while it's not, you're not nailed to the wall with it. Right. Um, you are probably going to get a higher rate. With that being said, there are some really quick and easy fixes that you can do to, to get um, your credit score up. So, you know, right. I, I would use one of those services. Uh, credit Karma is the one that comes mm -hmm. to mind. You can go on there, put your information in, and they'll say, hey, here's four or five things that you can do really, really quickly that will boost your score, right? That might right. be worth considering before you go in there because, uh, any you know, if you can save $86,000, then so be it, right? right? Even if it is 86000 $86,000 over the course of 30 years. Yep. That's still, it's still $86,000. $86, right. right. So it's just something to keep in mind. I, I would say, uh, definitely worth going and at least checking out. Right. And okay. by the way, everybody, if we're confusing you a little bit on mortgages themselves, I'm segment two is we're going to explain the details of mortgages yep. right now. Right now we are still in the process of how you buy a house and we're at the mortgage application process, which is just a right honest it, it it does get bogged down um, yeah. like this because there's just there's a, lot, think, a lot of yeah. things to consider. And I think it's important because, again, biggest purchase you're ever going to make. And I don't want anybody coming back to the old lifeadministration.com, <laughs> getting hit with a tweet being like, these guys have no idea what they're talking about, <laughs> right? So I, I do want to be uh, arduous in the process. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm going to save some questions for the end. So I, okay. I, cause I, have I need a to bunch. talk pre qualification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I don't want to like jump ahead or anything. Okay. So, um, because right now 
things do take time to get mortgages because mortgage companies are so slammed. Um, if you think that you're going to be purchasing a house sometime in the next three to six months, you might want to go ahead and even though you haven't started looking at all, shop around for a lender, tell them you are interested, and look for at least pre-qualification. So there's two things you can do. You can do a, it's kind of a truncated um, mortgage application process to get pre-qualified. And it basically said, yes, we, the bank, have done a cursory look at their assets and this person qualifies, will probably qualify for a mortgage for a $200,000 house. Mm -hmm. Okay. First of all, it makes you kind of pull some of the paperwork that you're going to need together and think through some of this stuff. Um, second of all, then when you're going and you've found a home and you're in the making the offer stuff, you know, having a pre-qualification letter basically says, I can do this a little faster than some other people. And yeah, I really do have the money. So if you get into a bidding war with some other buyer, um, that might help you out. If you have even more time, go ahead and get pre-approval. So this is when you get, um, you fill out a mortgage application and you get approved for a loan without knowing what the property is. Usually when you are making a mortgage application, you have found the property that you want. So you tell your mortgage lender that you've chosen, you tell them, this is the property that I want a mortgage on. And then they do a really deep, you know, because they're doing, they're looking at appraisals of the property and stuff like that. Pre-approval is saying, this is the price point that I'm in. Okay. And you can get pre-approved to, um, to buy any property or most properties under that threshold. Mm -hmm. Considering right now that approval takes about 30 days, if you are walking into a, any sort of bidding situation where you have another competitive bidder um, and you, let's go back, to, let's go to the 250 since it's basic, um, it's the average right now. So the property's being, they're asking 200 for it and um, you are offering 200, but you're pre-approved and the other mm -hmm. people are offering 210, but they haven't gotten pre-approved yet. And so they have to go through the 30-day process and they may not get approval, um, in which case that contract, they'll walk it. They'll take your lesser, their, your, your lesser offer at pre-approval. It's almost like wash, walking in with cash. Yeah. It's almost like walking in with cash, which basically if you walk in with cash, you're saying I can pay out of my own liquid bank accounts or investments or whatever. I can pay for this property up front. I don't need to get any bank to approve. I don't need any lending. So usually those, well, one, they can't blow up for lack of lending. And two, they tend to close in about 15 days or so after the option period of inspections, which mm -hmm. I'll get to in a second, right? Because then it's just a matter of, okay, all we have to do after we do the inspections is drop the paperwork. Yeah. So um, sellers really like cash offers. The next thing they like is pre-approvals um, and then pre-qualifieds help out. But pre-approvals and pre-qualifieds, if you know you're going to be buying in the near future, go ahead and going to have to go through the pain of the mortgage process of right. the mortgage application anyway go ahead and get it over with it will also help you focus on this is really what i can afford mm -hmm. um because part of your um mortgage application process will also will also deal with how much cash are you willing to go. so back to the hundred thousand dollar house you're going to buy a house for a hundred thousand dollars typically that means that you need to have twenty percent twenty thousand dollars cash to be able to put up at the closing so I'm going to pay $20,000 cash and I'm asking a bank to loan me $80,000 to pay you the rest. So you, the, the um, seller, get paid off immediately and you walk away. I've paid you 20 in cash. The bank's paid you another 80. Now it's my responsibility to pay the 80 plus interest back to the bank. Mm -hmm. That's what a mortgage is. Right. Right. Uh, with the caveat of first time home buyers. Yes. Typically... You don't have to do $20,000. So if you just heard that number and go, oh my gosh, I don't have $20,000. There is a, a, a specific set of rules and there are different types of products for first time home buyers that will give you a break that you don't necessarily have to put down. Which will come up in the mortgage application process because one of the main things that they will ask and they will want to know and that will affect your interest rate is whether or not you have to borrow any of the down payment. Right. So yes, that is available. But if you can, I would recommend that you put as much, even more than 20% down. You put as much cash down as, as you possibly as, can. As, as you can. And um, that's also part of the math of being house poor because lots of people will think, oh, I can afford that mortgage because I can borrow this for the down. Well, you've also got to, now the mortgage is the mortgage payment plus 
the amount that you borrowed for the down pay. At some point, you've got to pay that, and it's going to end up right. going up and up and up. Um, so that's one of the ways that, ooh, for instance, the 2008 crisis, there had been so much relaxing on how much people had to put down. So it gave people the impression that they could afford a bigger mm-hmm. mortgage than they actually could. Um, it's kind of mean. Yeah. It's kind of mean. So yes, that is available, but be very, very careful about how much cash you borrow for a down payment. So due diligence required there. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So now we, we've got our loan. We've got our pre-approval. We're going to okay, so make yeah. an offer. Right. So you've found the house, you've got your loan, um, or you've, you've got your, um, actually at this stage, if, if you haven't gotten it earlier, you've gotten pre-qualified. So, mm-hmm. um, so the seller has offered the house for 200000 and you make an offer. Um, usually, in a normal market, you would make an offer a little bit under. Um, but it kind of depends on how, again, your real estate agent will probably mm-hmm. give you some comps. You'll look around at other things, and you'll get, a, you'll get a feel. Jim and I have bought lots of properties over the years. Um, we have made um, one offer at the asking price. We've made an offer a little above the asking price, and we've made lots of offers um, 10% even below asking price. So it kind of depends on the lay of the land right there. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, somebody else could come in, and matter of fact, this is the car salesman thing. You know, um, I can't remember what it is that car salesmen say, but now it's escaping me. But real estate agents often will say, oh, well, they have another buyer. They have another, oh, they're they're expecting another bid. Okay, you kind of have to read it because you will almost always hear that. Mm -hmm. Um, And you kind of have to read between the lines on them. Do they really have another bidder waiting in the wings? Yep. Um, How much do you really want this property? How much you will? There's a lot of strategy and negotiation that goes into offer and acceptance. If you were the only bidder around, they've got it on for 200 and you offer 190, they might come back and say 195 and you say, "Um, no, because it's out of date and... um, and I have to add a, an expansion onto the garage or something like that. So I'm sticking at 195. Okay, fine. So offer, counter, counter offer, acceptance, wherever that ends up in um, is how you are. Now, if somebody else comes in, so I make an offer at um, on this $200,000 house at 190 and somebody else comes in at 195, or maybe somebody comes in at 190, but cash only. Mm-hmm. Um, then the realtor, my realtor might call me back and say, yeah, they have a, um, they have an offer at 195 and yours is 190. Do you want to beat it? I mean, it's kind of like an auction. Right. Right. Um, I'll, anyway, at some point you're going to end up with offer and acceptance and you're going to have an offer to um, buy the house at, let's call it 195. I'm going to buy this house at 195 and um, they're going to, they agree to sell it to me at 195. Mm-hmm. At this point, I have to put up what's called um, an earnest money payment. This is usually an almost a minimum amount, um, usually less than a hundred bucks. Basically, no, I really mean it. I'm I'm yeah. really serious. And you pay this directly to the seller. Okay. Um, rarely do you get it back. Yeah, this is right. just saying like I'm right. This serious. is just this is I I'm a real player. I, yeah. it, they, the law just makes it a little bit difficult for you to be, oh, well, I'm just shopping around and I'm having fun. And you tie something up for the option period. We'll get to that in a second. You tie something up for the option period just because you're goofing around. Okay. So they make it slightly painful. You have to pay the seller a hundred bucks and that's gone. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this happens at 4 p.m. on Sunday night. And you um, Venmo your, because now you can, I love that. Yep. I mean, it used to be that the realtor had to come up to your house and you know your currying checks and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, now between the lovely app called DocuSign, mm-hmm. um, you can sign all your documents online and you can Venmo the earnest money payment and you can get it done. So that's four o'clock on Sunday evening. So the next morning, Monday, is when your option period starts. Option periods usually last for 10 to 14 days. And this is the period when you go in and you inspect everything in the house. Okay. There are inspection companies that do, you know, it's the stuff that you, and unless we're home builders, we don't see all the time. I'm not paying close attention to all the electrical work, to all the plumbing, to any irregularities in the roof. I don't know how to judge if that crack on the floor is a foundation crack or just a little crack because of settling. Um, So you hire an inspector to come in and inspect the house. The buyer or the seller has to give you reasonable access in order to conduct inspections 
pursuant to buying the house. This is just, they have to do that. Oh, goodness gracious, I forgot about the option fee. <laughs> On, um, within three days of the option starting, you also have to pay an option fee. This is more significant, um, usually thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, this goes, usually goes into your down payment um, portion. <laughs> Different states have different rules exactly how it's treated or not, if you can get it back. Um, if at the end of the option period, say you cancel the contract because the inspector found stuff that you just, you don't want to deal with and thank you, you're going to walk the contract. Um, usually you get all or most of that option fee back. Got it. Um, when you go on to closing and, you know, the option fee was $8,000 and you're putting $20,000 down, you know, the option fee goes to, again, check your state laws are really check with your realtor. This is one of the reasons why you have a realtor because they will know this stuff mm -hmm. cold. Um, but when you start an option fee or when you start an option period, there's some money that has to come in and we haven't even gotten to the inspectors yet. Can I say one thing? Yes. Just back to the negotiation of the house, mm -hmm. making offers and stuff and being able to read as far as is, you know, oh, we got another offer, this, that, and the other mm -hmm. thing. One thing that you should know how long has the house been on the market for? Usually most of the websites now yep. will tell you how long the house has been listed. So for. if a house has been on the market right. for 60 plus days, you're no, there's not another offer, right? right. Just forget about it. Cause otherwise it would be gone right. by and now. And then there's other common sense things you can do. Let's say you find the house on a Saturday and you really like it. Um, and you know, it's got the property has an open house on Sunday. Okay. Well, Either A, attend the open house. Realtors will have a book open mm -hmm. that have people sign because they want to be able to capture the contact information mm -hmm. for anybody that walked in and might be interested in the house. So go to the open house yourself and then maybe hang out, you know, a few and see how many, see how many people are on the list, see how many people go in and out. If the place got 20 looks during the two, usually open houses are about two, two and three hours. Mm -hmm. um, if they got 20 people coming through it, do. Yeah, they probably got another offer. They're probably not bluffing you. If the house has been on the market for, you know, six months and there's another open house and you're the only person that showed up, the chances that they actually really have another offer on probably small. You know, you can kind of finesse some of those things. Yeah. Also, you do all of this through your agent. Your agent talks to their agent. You don't. Right. You're not talking. And um, it is unusual, not unheard of. Um, but sometimes kind of creepy to have the homeowner around while the house is being shown. Yeah. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it's not allowed, but it is very unusual to have, um, if the homeowner has an agent to have the homeowner remain either for an open house or, um, for any of the show. Mm -hmm. So, um, so see. options. So yes. yeah, we just right. finished so our option the, period. Right. So you're in the option period. Mm -hmm. You've done all the inspections now. The basic house inspection covers plumbing, electrical, roof, foundation, um, paint, general cosmetic age wear and tear on the house, stuff like that. And that you can have add-on inspections. So there, if you have a pool and, a, and or a spa, you'll need a separate inspection for that. So let's say, oh, the regular inspection is going to cost you 1200 bucks. Okay, well, the pool will be a $25 add-on. The spa will be a $25 add-on. Um, if you have a septic field rather than a um, sewage hook up into the city. Um, you're going to need a septic and, in, um, inspection. Um, that might require another specialist. So there might be a few specialists that need to come out. Um, so, um, septic might need its own. If you have a well on the property, um, so that you pump your own water, um, that will need its own inspection. Um, any other buildings, like say, maybe you're buying a ranch and there's a barn on the property. You're going to want to have an inspection of that. Usually your regular home inspector will do um, unless it's a specialty property, um, we'll do that. And that's most of these are $25, $50 add-ons. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, you can imagine how quickly the inspection gets up to be, you can spend $2,500 on your inspection easily. Yeah. Easily. Wow. Um, wow. so during the inspection, you are, um, you, the buyer, um, are allowed to be there. I actually use inspection times. Usually I let the inspector go off and do his or her thing. And I'm taking measurements of rooms, you know, like for a future for furniture, or maybe I'm taking pictures for color samples mm -hmm. and stuff. Cause I'm going to want to use the next period where the bank's just getting the information together, but we're all just kind of sitting there for two or three. I'm going to use it to do some um, prep work so that when moving day comes, I'm, you know, 
I don't have to start cold. Um, so um, your inspector's there, your, your, usually your agent is there. Um, and then at the end, after the inspector is done with their inspection and they're getting ready to write up their report, they'll sit down with you and explain some of the things they found. You know, well, we found some, you know, bare patches on the roof that you're going to want to have looked at. Or, and sometimes they have stuff that seems like relatively dumb stuff, mm -hmm. but they're required by law to say like, oh, anyway. There's a lot of things that are required by law to say that you're like, I'm Mine. not really going to care about that. Yeah. There's some things that will, you're like, oh my gosh, this, you know, this loose tile here. And he's like, that's cosmetic. I'm not even, I'm hardly even mentioning that other mm -hmm. than to say there's a few cosmetic, you know, wear and tear right. bits in the kitchen. Right. Um, but things like, ooh, um, I'm pointing to electric plate covers that it, those get pictures and end up on all of your inspections. You know, right. Um, That's so funny. <laughs> stuff 13 like 13 cents fix. You know what I mean? Right. Like, it, right. Exactly. Sometimes you're like, okay, that'll cost me. Why is that even on yeah. the inspection? But at the same time, if you're, if the inspector's telling you about a house that looks really great, but there's all sorts of stuff kind of behind the scenes, behind the couch. So, well, this electrical is loose and this suddenly you're like, okay, well, wait a second. How much maintenance have they done on this? Okay. So now you come up to a renegotiation period. Um, as your option period comes up to a close. Um, and let's say they found out that there was roof damage. Okay, you can go back and you can go and you can get a quote for roof damage or you can ask the inspector. Sometimes the inspector will give you an estimate. Okay, this roof, um, it clearly had some hail damage that they just patched over and they never truly fixed. You're probably looking at $2,000 to get that fixed. Okay, you can go back to the seller and then say, I want an allowance. I either want you to fix that mm -hmm. problem, or frankly, I'd like to fix it myself. I'm going to be the one living in the house, so I'd like to do that. I want an allowance. They tell me it's going to be $2,000, so you're going to give me that money back. When we go to closing, you're going to give, out of the proceeds that I pay you, you're going to give me $2,000 back so that I can go later and fix the roof, or I'm going to ask you to fix the roof yourself. Anyway, so you get into another little bit of renegotiation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and so when you're done with the option period, you might have a slightly different price than what you started, what your original offer and acceptance was. So let's say I offered one, or I'm getting this um, $200,000 house for one ninety five, dollars but they found a few defects and everything that I want remedied. So now we're, gonna, now we're actually planning going on um, to closing, and I'm paying you one ninety dollars for it. Got it. Because you've given me a $5,000 allowance to make some repairs mm. to the house that should have been made. And it is not cosmetics. If I want a $5,000 allowance so that I can repaint the whole thing, that's kind of, we're talking about system stuff. It turns out that the plumbing had never been updated and there's, you know, some major issue. Yep. All right. Now the option period is over and pretty much, not completely, pretty much everybody is locked in. Now, from the beginning of this, when you had original offer and acceptance, the seller has been locked into selling it to you. Unless you, in, unless you refuse to pay them, the seller has to sell yes. the property to you. Okay. Um, at the end of the option period, the buyer can say, can just walk away and just mm. be like, nope, you know what? I've thought about it some more. I just don't want to touch it. I can, I'm, I'm out. Yes. Termination of contract. Mm -hmm. Right. After the option period closes, everybody's now locked in with some certain caveats. If there is some major defect found after the um, option period and major defect, we're talking things like, oh my gosh, it turns out there's lead pipes. Right. Okay. Um, the seller can walk or the buyer can walk the contract at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. If um, the seller had never given the buyer the homeowners association agreements, and it turns out that the buyer, you know, it's a ranch property and the buyer planned on having their horses out there and everything. And then all of a sudden, oh, look, you can't have livestock. Okay. And you didn't get, if you'd already given them the age, if the seller had already given the buyer the HOA agreement yep. and the buyer just didn't look at, well, forget that. But if they'd avoided giving them that so that they could get the contract to go through, you can walk that mm -hmm. um, as well. And then the other one, now we're back to the bank. If the financing doesn't come through. Sometimes it happens during the option period. Often, especially right now with banks being so slammed. One of the things that they will do for their due diligence is they will send out an appraiser to look at the property. And the appraiser is looking at, 
all the comparables in the area. The appraiser goes and walks around the property and looks at everything from the roof condition to it doesn't do as the appraiser doesn't do an as thorough as an inspection as the inspector, but same thing. Okay, and so two hundred thousand dollar property. I offered one ninety five. You accepted one ninety five. We came up with you know an allowance for some damage and stuff. So now it's one ninety, and um, I'm putting. It's, it's 190. I'm putting 10,000 down. I'm just throwing out numbers here. So I'm borrowing 180 from the bank. And the bank's appraiser comes back and says, I'm sorry, this house is only worth 170. It only appraises at 170. The bank's not going to loan you the money if the a value, if they don't believe that the value of the house covers the amount of their loan risk because you're using the house as collateral for that loan. Mm -hmm. If you default on the loan, if you stop paying the loan, the bank, bankruptcy, some bankruptcy rules and homesteading notwithstanding, goodness gracious, told you this gets confusing. Yeah. The bank can come in and foreclose your house so they can take your house and sell it out from under you to satisfy their debts. Yeah. Okay. So they're not going to loan you the money if the house doesn't appraise for the amount that you're going to borrow from it. Um, if the financing fails, then they can also, the seller or the buyer can also walk the contract, which is one of the main reasons why um, sellers prefer to have cash or pre-approval or pre-qualified um, offers. And they will tend to accept those faster than they would just an uh, offer coming in from anywhere. Because now we are 20 days in. They've had the house basically off the market now for 20 days, thought they had a sale, and they don't. Yeah. Right. That, they that don't can like be, that at all. No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're thinking and a, a little bit of fluctuation because of COVID, but from the, the time that you start the process to the time that you close, how long is that? Sounds like 45 days right now. Yep. Usually in normal times, mm -hmm. I've usually seen it around 30 days. Okay. Um, but right now the bank has told me that it's about 30 days to approval and then about another 15 days to do um, all of the paperwork. Because once, once everybody's locked in, you know, yep. we've got financing, um, there's no big surprises coming along, the option period has come and gone, and we've re renegotiated whatever allowances we have from the inspections. Okay, now it's really the banks and the title company just coming up with all of the paperwork. So the bank uses a title company to basically search title. These are the, this is the piece of paper or the files that track when the property came into existence, you know, when the land was plotted mm -hmm. for that, who owned it first, who owned it second, who owned it third, and what covenances and laws run with that property, okay? Um, and this is where also mineral, I, we can get very confusing mineral rights, water rights. Um, if you're buying waterfront property, do you have waterfront all of that stuff, the bank is going to send the title company to go through and just basically do a title search and make sure we've got, you know, person A sold it to person B, who sold it to person C. And each time they conveyed all of these things along with it. And this homeowners association um, document came in at person C and bound person, person C signed it. So when they sold it to person D, person D was bound by, you know, so we're, we're um, oh, what's it called in police stuff? Um, chain of possession. We're just following the chain of possession. It takes a while for that to get done. Oh, my goodness. Right. I'm going to call a timeout here. This was segment one, <laughs> and we're at the 50-minute mark. So we are doing another two-part episode, it sounds like. It could be three. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Oh, my gosh. I mean, there is so much information. I would encourage, like, listen, I'm sitting here. I am... You know, you're not going to find a more engaged listener than me right now, because right? Because you're you're motivated. I, I, and you're like, shoot, I'm three to six months out. Yep, right. And I'm all I can think about is when can I rewind this thing and listen to all of that again? Like there is there is so much, and it's good, thick, strong information. There is not a lot of fluff in the things that you said. <laughs> it is very much. It's, it's going to be like our insurance episode yep. again. Really, really dry, but lots of good information that people need. I, but I mean, it is it's. Bang. It was just a very, very great breakdown of the process of buying the house, right? Kind of before you before anything else. It was just very, very good. And and honestly, might, you know, we've said before, we lightly script these episodes. 
but there's probably more show notes in this segment than there have been in entire other episodes, right? right? So very, 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 very good stuff. I still have a ton of questions that I want to ask, but we're going to, we're going to hit the pause button right here okay? and we'll pick it up. Um, we'll pick it up next week. So anyway, if you have enjoyed this podcast today, please, if it's helped you, if it's done anything, share it with a friend, do something. But like there are people buying houses out there. I'm there one are. of them. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. We really appreciate it. Thumbs up. Leave a comment. That really does help us out. We can't thank you enough for that. Also, uh, if you're listening to us on Google Play, Spotify, Apple Music, a five star rating would really be appreciated if it you want to leave a, a comment in there as well. That also really helps us out. You can find me on Twitter at Ryan Talon, R Y A N T A I L L O N. Leslie? I am Leslie Loftus Tex on Twitter, and I've started using that even a little bit more. Um, and then mostly I just do the show notes on Pinterest at Life Administration and here on the website, lifeadministration.com. Yes, and on lifeadministration.com. Uh, we have gotten some new subscribers lately, which has been pretty cool. Oh, sweet. Yep. I uh, don't so, look. Yep, so, some, yep. some, yeah, it, we try not to look. We just do our thing and, <laughs> and, and let it roll. Uh, so thank you guys for for uh, subscribing. And we're going to be having some, some cool stuff that we're going to be adding to the website here pretty soon to make it uh, even more focused experience. We started with our curated courses. Mm -hmm. That's obviously we're going to be adding. We've, we've actually done. Clearly um, we're going to have some curated courses on mortgages and home buying. Yeah. It's just <laughs> uh, absolutely, man. Thank you so much. What is that dinging? I forgot to mute my computer. So that's and the alert in the background. You're going to kill me. Goodness. You're going to kill me. And I'm I know. Okay, I'm muting it now because I think we're going to have to record the next one. Yeah, muting it now. Wonderful. <laughs> At, you could, couldn't have done that 45 minutes ago, 50 minutes ago. Anyway. I'm sorry. I've been Ryan Talon. And I have been Leslie Loftus. It's been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. And you guys have been awesome. We'll see you guys in the next one. Take care. Thanks.